Hey everyone, and welcome to part three of this three-part series on mixed model material management, a crash course. So let's do a quick recap. And by the way, if you haven't seen the section one or section two, you can view those right from this page. So I would suggest you go ahead and do that. Uh, just stop this video and go watch the other two. But let's recap quickly what we've covered in those previous two. In the first uh, section, we talked about the importance of material management. I think we're kind of preaching to the crowd preaching to the choir um, in talking about the importance of it, but we just wanted to emphasize the fact that for most companies, materials are the major part of your product cost, the majority of your product cost. That's not always true, but for many products, it's 60 to 70 or maybe even greater percentage of your product cost is materials, things that you buy on the outside that you have to bring in and manage. And the other important thing is that it's a major part of your balance sheet. Now on the balance sheet, you've got this thing, group of things called assets, and inventory is oftentimes the largest one. Unless you're somebody like um, Microsoft or, or who's the other big one? Apple, who have tons of cash on their balance sheet. Uh, but for most companies, inventory is, if not the biggest, one of the biggest items on your balance sheet. So the better we can manage all of this inventory, both in terms of the amount we have and then, then how we handle it, how we manage it and get it to where it's going to be used, the better. So huge, hugely important uh, issue for most manufacturing companies. Now, in the second section of this uh, three-part series, we talked about what are the major elements of a lean material management system? What's different about lean material management compared to just regular old material management or plain vanilla material management? And we identified a couple areas where lean companies tend to put a lot of time and effort and emphasis. And one of them is on, this is a, a smaller one, but worth mentioning is containerization. So establishing standards for bins and containers and not allowing too much variety of those and then sizing those to be relatively small so they can be picked up and delivered. And when you have smaller containers, you're also committing to more frequent deliveries correct, rather than a big, huge Gaylord that you can put down next to a station and not have to touch for some days, weeks, or sometimes months. So that's one, one important uh, aspect of a lean material delivery system. Now, even bigger picture, the concept of plan for every part is something we talked about. So plan for every part is a pretty simple concept, but uh, it can get very involved because when we talk about materials and down to the part, part number level, you've got lots of them. So not unusual to have thousands or tens of thousands or even more different items that you have to manage and keep track of. So plan for every part means for every single item, show me all the information related to that regarding procurement, storage, cost, shelf life, where it's stored, how we're going to signal, how we're going to move it, so conveyance, all of the issues I can see in one place, which typically you do not find in an ERP or MRP system. You may find most of this information, probably not all of it, but it's scattered. It's in different modules all over the place. So the idea here is let's put all this information in one place and then be able to manipulate it, add to it. For example, Kanban calculations. Uh, is not something that's normally included in an ERP or MRP system. Now, there may be some functionality, there may be place to store Kanban information, but by and large, uh, at least the way we think of it, this is something that's often not included, but it could be easily included in a spreadsheet kind of environment. So that's planned for every part. Next thing that, uh, that lean companies pay a lot of attention to is delivery routes, the design of delivery routes. In fact, they treat material handling not as a an overhead function that is just simply tacked on as a percentage of direct labor or uh, a rough estimate of how many people they need. They design their material delivery systems just like you design a production line. And in many times, the material delivery system is actually integrated with the production line. For example, if your production line is running at a tack time of make up, make up, make up a time, five minutes, some companies may actually design their material delivery system around that five minutes so that in the most extreme example, they're delivering material every five minutes at the same rate of consumption on the line. Or it's a multiple of the five minutes. So six times five is half an hour. So maybe their half, their half an hour is their cycle around which they design the material delivery system. 
And of course, material delivery system and routes uh, are physical as well. So we're talking about pathways, aisles, what kind of conveyance is going to be used, what items are going to be delivered in this way, which items are exceptions. Some items, for example, may require a fork truck. Maybe most of them can be delivered via a tugger and a cart, those kind of issues. So that's another big area. And uh, last one is this golden key, not the last one, but the, the one we'll mention here, the golden key to shortage proofing your line is the ratio between the amount of inventory you have at a point of use, say at a workstation, in terms of hours of usage, and the frequency of your delivery routes. And the bigger that difference, the higher that ratio, the more shortage proof your line is going to be. So if you have, say, four hours of inventory at a workstation, and you deliver once an hour, that's a one to four relationship. You can actually consume that material at the station much faster than planned. Planned was four hours, but you can actually consume it more quickly if the customer requires that and still not run the risk of stopping the line because you ran out of parts. So really important concept. In fact, some companies, as I mentioned that we know, uh, whose name begins with the letter T, actually design a, an eight to one relationship between the delivery route frequency and the amount of inventory. But that still allows you, if you have a short enough delivery frequency, to have relatively little inventory out there on the factory floor or at the station. So that's where we left it. And what we promise you this time is we're gonna get into the, in this lesson, get into more the how. So how do we go about doing this? Well, one thing I think we talked about last time was this isn't really that hard. These concepts are not that hard. It does require constancy of purpose, and that's uh, W. Edwards Deming's phrase. In other words, don't give up. Don't go, you know, don't go to one thing and then go to another thing, but stick with it. Uh, but if you stick with it, these ideas are not that hard. But what I promised to you were, were some of the tools that maybe you could use to, um, to get started. Uh, you don't really need these, but uh, to get started. So what I'm going to do on this page, we're going to put a link to a plan for every part worksheet that includes some Kanban calculations. So go ahead and download that uh, Excel file. You'll be able to take a look at it and I think you'll, you'll, you'll be able to figure it out. There are some formulas on the Kanban calculation quantities, but you can just look at the formula line and uh, probably figure out pretty easily what's going on. But uh, as we said before, plan for every part, just picture a massive spreadsheet um, with lots of rows, those are all the part numbers, and then lots of columns, those are all the data elements that you want to look at or, or see for each part number. So we'll, we'll uh, allow you to download this Excel spreadsheet. This is one that we use, but every company can be different. You can add your own columns, uh, manipulate this uh, as you wish. So that's our first little bonus for you. Now, uh, before I go on to a pretty exciting announcement, uh, coming up. I just wanted to respond to some of the questions. This will just take a minute or two, but some of the questions that people had submitted and see if we can answer those related to this issue of lean material handling. So the first question here is this. Um, this came through the, the web page. It says, material handling is regarded as overhead. So what if we go through this analysis, I'm kind of paraphrasing here a little bit, and we need more handlers, you know, more handling. Uh, you know, what, what do we do then? Well, the answer there is that could, that could easily happen. If we decide as a strategy to deliver more frequently than you have been used to in the past, that may require more people. But the issue is not more people or less people. The issue is the total cost of this strategy. So wouldn't it make sense if you have to add more material handlers, uh, if you have to do that, that somehow you're doing a better job of delivering material more frequently, less inventory. So on the other side, you have a reduction in the amount of inventory you have on the factory floor, which also reduces the floor space, which also probably has a positive impact on operators. So if we look at all the factors that may be impacted, the main point is that you want those to re you want our strategy to reduce the total cost of your material delivery system. In fact, the total cost of operations. And if you can do that, then you're taking the right steps. But that may require, that may require, and in fact, people that visit factories that are doing this kind of lean material management often comment that, gee, it seems like they're doing a lot of handling that, the, that you're not used to in your home plant. That may actually be true. 
but the overall cost impact and the overall inventory reduction and the shortage proofing of the line all offset that potential additional handling. So that's our recommendation there. Just look at the total cost. All right, here's another one. I'm looking at my list here. It says, our biggest problem is outside suppliers. Okay, so uh, the implication here is we, we have the internal, within the four walls of our factory, we have the internal process down for delivering material. There's probably still room for improvement there, but the biggest issue is problems maybe on quality or delivery or both from outside suppliers. So what to do there? Well, again, there's no magic solution here, but uh, let's look at what the big boys do, what the people, the company's successful. Uh, and, and that's not to say that issues never happen. They do. But what, what is it they do? Well, one thing that you'll notice is that companies like Toyota, like lean, mature lean companies, typically establish long-term relationships with one supplier. Now, they may have backup, uh, but they don't spread a PO over multiple suppliers for the same item. They pick one and they invest in that supplier. Uh, easier said than done, right? But that's exactly what they do. They select suppliers who are often geographically close by so they can set them up on a milk run and they can allow them to produce to a Kanban signal, right? So a truck will come by at some predictable frequency and they'll actually invest in these suppliers, even to the point of sending engineers to these plants if there are issues. Uh, and then typically, once, once a supplier is established, uh, they no longer do receiving inspection. So the first orders, the first few orders, yes, but beyond a certain point, they, they don't do receiving inspection and they stick with that supplier. Now that supplier knows, and this is, this is a, actually what, what I was told, the supplier knows that they have a good customer uh, in Toyota, for example, they're probably not going to get super rich, but they're going to stay in business, they're going to do well, and they're going to partner, but they have to be able to deliver on quality and frequency of delivery and respond to these Kanban signals. So I wish there was a magic solution to outside suppliers, and especially if you're smaller, uh, you, don't, you usually don't have that kind of clout with outside suppliers. So um, it's not, uh, not as easy as just simply telling them what to do at all. Now here's an interesting one. Um, another question was, what are your thoughts on kitting? It says, we're very short on line side space. We're considering going more to kitting. Well, uh, I have to say, I, I think what we've seen is kind of a sea change in, uh, in lean material handling philosophy. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, when we first started uh, teaching this stuff, it's actually been longer than that, um, Kanban was kind of the main focus of, of our material strategy. So most items, and this is still probably true, most items would fit into a Kanban delivery kind of model. Two bin or multiple bin Kanban, as we've talked about in this uh, series. But what we've seen here is a sea change where uh, some companies are going more and more to kidding for a couple reasons. One often is space, right? much less space. If you, if you just give the operator exactly what they need for that one unit, then uh, you, save, you could save potentially a whole lot of space. And if you're in a mixed model environment, as we're kind of discussing here in this series, then uh, you don't have to store a multitude of items in front of the operator that for, for many products are not being used. Right? And then when the model comes along that needs that part, it's there, but still, it's a lot of space. So space is, is one issue. But Another issue is this, part selection. So if you have a lot of items in front of a, an operator, you're asking them to reach out and pick the right part. And if you have items that look very similar, uh, the risk of picking out the wrong part, especially if it will fit, uh, is higher. So there, there are techniques to try to get around that. There's a what's called pick to light, right? So maybe you have an RFID signal that triggers some lights so the lights uh, for the parts required for this item go on on the bins. That's a kind of a high-tech, high high-complexity solution, um, which we've seen, but that's one way to address that. But kidding, back to the kidding, you don't have the material in front of them. Instead, you're presenting the material to the operator in a tray or traveling with the unit. And you, you, um, you also allow a kind of a double check on the materials, if that's a concern. There's one person that picked it, and then the operator itself could perform a double check and make sure the parts are the one, the correct ones. So that's second benefit or concern. 
And the third one is this. If you're asking operators to reach out, select parts and so on, while they're doing that, especially if they have to turn around or they have to walk a few feet, move around to get what they need, uh, that is what we call MUDA, waste, right? Non-value added activity. So if you can reduce that, then the operator gets to spend more time actually adding value, right? Doing the work that they're hired to do. So we, might, we may find with a kidding strategy that, um, that there's, a, there's a productivity gain. And remember, for every kidder or every material handler, you probably have more than one operator. So if you can have a, posit enough, a positive enough impact on operators, then that can offset the potential extra effort that may be required to, to build kits. And then the fourth recommendation on kits is integrate it with a line. So don't be thinking about kitting as something that's done outside or done in a warehouse or done even by an outside supplier, but it's done as a part of the line design itself. So you're, you're kitting or picking kits at the same tack time as the line or a multiple thereof uh, and, and physically co-locate that. Uh, so we've seen that and, uh, and we've heard uh, word of mouth, you know, verbal confirmation that this has been positive. So keep that in mind. So that's our feeling about kits. We're more, in other words, we're more open to kits than, than we have been. Okay, so here's the opportunity uh, that I want to share with you. Um, about four years ago, here's the backstory. About four years ago, uh, we, uh, we um, entered into a, a relationship with Toyota Material Handling in Columbus, Indiana. And uh, they were willing, they have a very nice training center there. Uh, and they produce fork trucks at this particular plant. So they're, they're producing material handling equipment, not just fork trucks, but uh, Toyota in general has a ver you know, variety of different material handling uh, equipment that they manufacture, not all at this plant, but this is the fork truck plant. And uh, so uh, we're, we're, we started teaching a, uh, two classes. One was called mixed model line design. The other was mixed model material management there about once every quarter. So one of these classes once a quarter. And the, the beauty of, of teaching it there is, number one, it's a very nice facility. Number two, we get to uh, take our students on plant tours of, of a world-class facility. This was plant of the year in 2011, 2012, one of the 10 best plants in America. So this was a great place to learn about something and then go out and see it in action, especially, especially as it applies to material management. So mixed model material management, perfect place to be teaching the class. So students leave with not just the ideas, concepts, or you did simulations in a conference room, but you actually went out into a functioning factory. In fact, one of the best factories in North America. And you were able to see the things that you learned in the class, see them in action. That's incredibly valuable. So we have one of these classes coming up uh, that we wanted to share with you. Uh, so. Mixed Model Material Management is on June 7th um, or around that time frame. You'll see on the registration page. And uh, it's in Columbus, Indiana. So this is uh, Indianapolis is the closest big airport, but you could fly into Louisville or Cincinnati, one of those places, or drive if you happen to be somewhere in the Midwest and, uh, and spend three days going through lean material management as we've touched on in this series, but clearly in three days instead of uh, 90 minutes, and, um, and then be able to take two plant tours as a part of this experience, and also uh, spend lunchtime with the Toyota folks. Uh, you can hear from us at the Leonardo Group, but you can also hear from the Toyota folks, a chance to brainstorm, Q&A, ask questions. So it's just, it's just a great experience. Um, so. Maybe that's all I'll say about it right now, but you can read more about it. There's a link on this page to register for this class. So um, click on that link. You can see the full syllabus. Uh, look at the topics we'll be talking about and, and discussing. Uh, a lot of hands-on work as well, so it's not all lecture. So tours, hands-on exercises, and then really embedding these lean concepts into your knowledge base. So uh, highly recommend it, encourage you to find out more about it. Also encourage you, if this seems of interest to you, to take some action. This, this workshop is actually already half filled. 
And the, although it's a beautiful facility, there are only 32 seats. So we have about 16 people already registered as of this filming. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, dilly-dally, but uh, if this is something of interest to you, go ahead and, and get registered. And if you can do it before May 6th, yeah, do it before May 6th, you can also take advantage of an early bird discount. All right, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that and uh, hope to see you there.